For most adults, alcohol is an indulgence enjoyed in moderation. It livens up special occasions or serves as a way to unwind after a long day. However, there are some people who become dependent on it, relying on it as a crutch to get through their day-to-day -day lives. Unfortunately, the impact of alcoholism extends beyond the consumer and can affect loved ones such as spouses and children. These children often take on the role of caretaker for parents dealing with alcoholism, and their home may be an unstable environment, lacking the vital sense of security that kids need. And this was the reality for one Michigan teenager named Megan Amirowitz, who took on this caretaker role for her father during his darkest periods of alcoholism. They had their fair share of arguments, but anger and resentment caused one altercation to go too far. This case raises questions about what level of accountability a child should bear for a mistake made in anger, especially when it results in someone getting hurt. It's obvious that something horrible happened in the Amirowitz home, but was it really a mistake? Or had Megan simply reached her breaking point? Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life. Let's dive. <laughs> All right, guys, now there's a lot of things I don't know that I probably should know, not only for my age, but just like as a human, as a mother, these things. And recently I learned something that I ignorantly never knew was a thing, and that's the importance of gut health. Apparently our gut is connected to our brains and like controls everything, our energy, our mood, everything. It's incredible how our gut plays such a crucial role in our overall well-being. And that's why taking care of our gut health is more important than ever. And that is where my new friend, Colin Broom, comes in. Colon Broom is the key to a healthy gut and so much more. It's not just about cleansing the colon and reducing the risk of colon cancer. It goes way beyond that. Colon Broom works as a prebiotic, nourishing our healthy gut bacteria and promoting a balanced gut environment. And I'll be honest and maybe a little bit like TMI, but you guys are my friends. But here it goes. For as long as I can remember, I've struggled with bloat and being regular and truly since I was probably like 13 years old so when I tried colon broom for the first time it was like my bloat was gone I was just so much more comfortable it was like a whole new world say goodbye to bloating digestion issues and those pesky problems keeping regular colon broom is here to support your digestive system and keep it running smoothly it's like a breath of fresh air for your gut but the benefits do not stop there. By slowing down the absorption of sugar, Colon Broom also helps lower the risk of diabetes too. It's incredible how something just as simple as taking care of our gut can have such a positive impact on our overall health. With Colon Broom, you'll experience a clean and regular intestinal tract like never before. It's like literally hitting a reset button and giving your gut the care that it deserves. And guess what? You'll also notice a visible improvement in your overall skin health. Again, it's just so amazing to me how like every everything is connected. Oh yeah, and also let's not forget about cholesterol because Colon Broom helps lower bad LDL cholesterol levels, ensuring that your heart stays healthy. Get Colon Broom with more than 65% off and claim my special offer and an extra 10% off. Join the biggest sale yet and get six months worth of Colon Broom with up to 65% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Use code 10 to life to get an extra 10% off your whole order. Just click that link in my description and grab your discounted batch of colon broom while the stock lasts. So 10 to lifers, let's prioritize our gut health and give colon broom a try. It's time to take back control of our well-being from the inside out. Your gut will thank you and you will feel amazing. Trust me, it is a game changer. When Michigan couple Conrad and Julie Amirowitz decided to settle down and have children, it wasn't as easy for them as they thought that it was going to be. After trying for months with no success, Julie went to the doctor and was told that it was unlikely that she would ever be able to conceive children naturally. This was obviously very sad and confusing news. Even though Conrad was 44 years old at the time, Julie was just 31 years old, and it came as a surprise that she probably wouldn't be able to get pregnant naturally. 
But Conrad and Julie didn't let this unexpected bump in the road stop them from being parents and raising a family together. They decided that they were going to adopt, and in 2002, they adopted their now 23-year-old son Austin when he was just a 27-month-old toddler, a little over two years old. Fourteen months later, on September 29, 2003, they adopted their now 19-year-old daughter after she was born and placed up for adoption. The baby had been born to a mother addicted to substances, and the first months of her life wouldn't be easy at all. However, Conrad and Julie decided that they could care for her and love this little girl. They adopted the baby just three days after she was born, and they named her Megan Joyce. Now, you can imagine their shock when only a couple of months later, Julie actually found out she was pregnant. This was completely unexpected, and their third child was another little girl, who they named Morgan. With three kids in diapers and pull-ups, Julie quickly realized how expensive disposable diapers could be, and she decided to start a business to combat the issue. So she started a cloth diaper company called KJAMM, which stood for Conrad, Julie, Austin, Megan, and Morgan. Making cute cloth diapers kept her busy every day, and she was able to work mostly from home while Conrad worked as a program manager at HP Enterprise Services, which is an information technology company. Three years later, the family was blessed once more with another son, now a teenager, who they named Ian. Conrad and Julie went from feeling hopeless about having children to now having a full house of little ones. After enduring two high-risk pregnancies, Julie became extremely passionate about helping women like herself. So she started another business. This one was a nonprofit organization called Journey Through Motherhood High Risk Pregnancy and Beyond. The Amirowitz family lived in Groveland Township, a quiet and secluded community located in Oakland County, Michigan. And even though the family started out strong, Problems started arising between Conrad and Julie when Conrad started drinking on a regular basis. The couple ultimately decided to file for divorce in 2011, which was really hard on all of the children, especially Megan, who had a very close bond with her father. For the first couple of years, the couple had joint custody, but the children primarily lived with Julie. However, when Austin and Megan were 12 and 13 years old, Conrad and Julie decided to let them make the choice of who they wanted to live with. Morgan and Ian would stay with Julie, but Austin and Megan decided to move in with their dad. Conrad was definitely the more lenient of the two in regards to rules, and as preteens, Austin and Megan thought that their father would be more fun to live with. You get away with a little bit more, he's a little bit more lenient. And this was even more true as they got into high school, and they started to get away with more than they ever would have been able to had they lived with Julie. However, Julie always made it clear to them that they could both always come live with her whenever they wanted, no matter what. Living apart was a little difficult for Morgan to cope with in the beginning because she and Megan had always been so close and had shared a room together. But since they were only 11 months apart, once they got into high school, they often had classes together and got to see each other every day and even on the weekends. Plus, now they each got their own room, which was nice as a teenager, so it wasn't all bad. They were trying to see the positives and everything. Most people who knew Megan knew that she was a little spoiled. She was definitely a daddy's girl, and he rarely told her no. Now, part of this may have been due to Conrad becoming more and more dependent on alcohol and wanting to make up for his behavior by giving her whatever she wanted. As Austin and Megan got older, though, constantly having to babysit their dad started to take a toll on them. Austin had a lot of things that he wanted to do with his life, and he started to develop these feelings of anger and resentment toward his dad. Drinking all the time also meant that Conrad was hungover all the time and he started to neglect things like cleaning up the house, taking care of the yard, and keeping the house a suitable place for his children to live and grow up in. Eventually, Morgan and Ian just stopped visiting altogether because his house was so dirty and it was just becoming a problem and they didn't enjoy going there. Austin and Megan rarely wanted to have friends over because their dad would embarrass them by being drunk and they were also embarrassed at the state of their house. 
People who knew the family, including Julie, had said that Austin and Conrad started arguing more and more, and their arguments even began to escalate into physical altercations. Austin would become so frustrated with their dad's behavior that he'd sometimes hit and kick him. The day of Austin's high school graduation, Conrad showed up drunk, with half of his head shaved, not showered, and slurring his words during the high school graduation ceremony. The family then threw Austin a small graduation party, and people who attended said that Conrad was drunk and smelled like urine. So it's not hard to understand why as soon as Austin turned 18, he was out of there. Throughout high school, he saved up money so that the moment he graduated, he could move out, and he did. Austin ended up moving in with some friends to distance himself from the toxic environment that their house was becoming. However, Megan was still there, and now she was left to take care of their dad all on her own. While Megan started to develop some behavioral issues as well, her behaviors were directed toward others rather than her father. See, there was an incident at school when Megan allegedly had a knife and another where she threatened a teacher, and this caused her to be expelled. After this, Conrad helped get his daughter enrolled in homeschool. On another occasion, Conrad was intoxicated and unable to drive Megan somewhere that she needed to go, so she took his car without permission and she ended up wrecking it. So clearly, neither of them were perfect, but they never turned their back on one another through all of this. They were still a family. They were tight-knit, and they loved each other. Now, if you've ever known someone who deals with alcoholism or any addiction, you'll know that before they can accept any help, they often have to go through periods of denial about their problem. And Conrad seriously minimized dependency, and even though he was still able to keep his job and do his job, it's clear that he was just a functioning alcoholic due to his tolerance building up over time. But as all this was happening, Megan wanted to focus on normal teenage girl stuff, like her love of clothing, shopping, and of course, hanging out with friends. Most kids we know have chores like doing the dishes, sweeping, mopping, laundry, cleaning their room. But Megan became very overwhelmed with maintaining an entire household, and the work just really became too much. Dishes started stacking up, fast food trash was piling around the house, mountains of dirty and clean laundry, and to make matters worse, Conrad and Megan had several cats who would just use the bathroom anywhere in the house. Julie had said that a couple of times she would even come over to try and help clean up the house, but one room took her 10 hours. She said that she would gag when she went into the basement because of the overwhelming smell of cat urine and feces. By 2020, the house was described as looking like a house from the TV show Hoarders. Stuff absolutely everywhere and filth absolutely everywhere. Now, as we know, every family has its issues. I mean, I don't think that there is such a thing as a normal family. And even the closest and most stable families have their quirks. There has only been small bits of information sprinkled here and there, but for some reason, after Austin moved out, he eventually told his family that he no longer wanted anything to do with them. However, after some time and some distance, he did start to visit his dad occasionally, and Conrad would even drive Austin to work sometimes. It was more like Austin wanted to distance himself specifically from his mom and his siblings, and some people have speculated that Austin has held resentment toward Julie ever since the divorce. He may have blamed her for being forced to choose which parent to live with, and then for the chaotic and filthy conditions that he and Megan were living in with their dad. Maybe Conrad's drinking problem got worse after the divorce and Austin felt like Julie didn't do enough to fix it and then got his younger siblings to take her side. And that's a normal feeling many people go through after their parents' divorce. Just like blaming one or both parents, feeling like they didn't try, and feeling angry that you had to be split between two homes. But again, that's just speculation and it's not fully known why Austin became estranged from everyone. Regardless, so much inner turmoil within the family may have been another reason why Megan felt like she needed to be her dad's rock, so to speak. Maybe feeling that guilt and that pressure of not wanting to abandon him now that her brother had moved out, now that the divorce was done, all of these things, that she was the last one there for her father. That's an insane amount of guilt to carry. So by 2021, it seemed like Conrad's drinking had taken a turn and started affecting his health as well. 
It's no secret that long-term heavy drinking can cause damage to your body. We all know that. It can cause mood swings, irritability, insomnia, fatigue, weakened immune system, liver disease, blood sugar issues, and just so much more. And Julie has said that Conrad called her and told her that his urine had started to become very dark, a very dark brown color, which can be a sign of all sorts of medical issues. He was starting to develop some urinary issues and would often lose control of his bladder after drinking as well. He also was falling quite often, which for a man in his 60s by that point was really dangerous, especially since they had stairs in the home. Megan would be the one to always pick him up and get him somewhere to lay down. Now, I'm not sure if he worked from home or something, especially after COVID when many tech jobs transitioned to work from home, but it just seems like other people would see the bumps and the bruises and smell alcohol on him if he were going into an office regularly. But despite all of this, Megan loved her dad. All of his kids loved their dad, and the others just didn't necessarily want to be around him when he was drinking or at his house, but they still cared about him. Megan had described him as her best friend, which may be another reason why she felt so responsible for him and didn't want to leave him. Because don't forget, Megan did have the choice to live with her mom, but she may have felt scared of what would happen to him if he were left alone. Some people think that she really only liked it there because she could basically do whatever she wanted, though. Which, I mean, someone who's passed out can't really enforce a curfew. There really aren't any rules there. I mentioned before that Megan was considered spoiled. Clearly only to a point, because if Conrad had endless funds to spoil her with, then he probably would have hired a crew to help clean up the home and do things like that. But Julie has said that when Megan wouldn't get her way, she'd do the typical teenage bratty behavior, stomp off to her room, whine, cry, but she wasn't violent like Austin was. She wouldn't ever hit anybody, and she had never physically hurt her dad. They'd have back and forth yelling matches, but their disagreements would always resolve quickly. In September of 2021, Megan had been planning her 18th birthday, and she started talking over ideas with her dad. Her actual birthday was September 29th, but the plan was to celebrate with her friends on Friday, October 1st, after everybody was out of school. Conrad had agreed to pay for a room for Megan and her friends to have a hotel party. There were a lot of times when Conrad wouldn't end up following through on his promises, though, but she was expecting him to keep his word this time for her birthday. Even though she was about to be 18, Megan didn't drive, possibly because of her prior driving incident when she took her dad's car. Who knows? But because of this, Conrad also promised that he would drive her to go get her hair done the morning before her party. When the day of the party arrived, Megan woke up excited to get the day started by going to her hair appointment at around 10.30 a.m. After that, she'd go book the hotel room so that she and her friends could set up and then they would all get ready together. However, when she got out of bed, she went to look for her dad and found him passed out on the couch in the living room. Megan tried to wake him up, but he was clearly either drunk or hungover and he was not moving from the couch. According to Megan, she obviously became really upset because Conrad had promised to take her to get her hair done, so she started yelling at him to get up. He sort of came to, and they started yelling at each other before he rolled over, turning away from Megan. In hurt, anger, and frustration, Megan started grabbing various items that were just laying around their messy, cluttered home and began throwing them at her dad. When it was obvious that he was too impaired to take her to the appointment, she called one of her friends to see if they could take her instead. When her friend said yes, not a problem, we definitely can, Megan was still hurt, but she felt better now that she had another ride. And while she waited, she took a picture of herself crying on Snapchat and sent it to her good friend Kayla, who would be coming to the party later. Kayla asked Megan what was wrong, and she told her about how her dad was drunk, how she had thrown some stuff at him, and how it was just a bad morning. Megan then asked Kayla if she would be able to pick her up and drive her to the hotel later, but since Kayla was at school, she didn't respond right away to the message. Even though she was mad, Megan has said that she was mostly over it by the time her friend picked her up for her hair appointment, and she told her dad bye as she walked out the door. After Megan got her hair done, she went to pay with her dad's bank card, but either the PIN number wasn't working or she was misremembering it. So she tried to call her dad several times, but she figured that he had passed out again because he wasn't answering her calls. 
Now, details are a little fuzzy after her hair appointment, but it was mentioned that Megan's grandfather ended up using his card to pay for the hair appointment. Around this same time, Kayla finally messaged Megan back and told her that she could drive her to the hotel, but Megan said it was okay that she had gotten another ride not to worry about it. A little bit later, around 3.45 p.m., Megan called Kayla and asked her if she could stop by her house to check on her dad and to ask him the PIN number for his bank card so that she could book the hotel. See, Megan and Kayla had been friends for about five years, and they just lived a two-minute drive away from each other. Even though Megan was embarrassed of her house, Kayla had been inside before, and she knew Conrad, and she knew how he was. So Kayla told her that she was going to eat something really quick and that she would absolutely stop by the house to talk to Conrad before heading to meet up with Megan for the party with all of their friends. So Kayla arrived at Megan's house around 4 p.m. Entering the home, there's a landing and then some stairs that lead up to the living room area and another set that goes down into the basement. It was typical for Kayla to just walk into their house, and when she started up the stairs, she heard Conrad call out, hello. So Kayla said hello, and then when she reached the living room, she was shocked by what she saw. The complete mess isn't what shocked Kayla. She had seen all of that before. She'd even seen Conrad drunk before. But this was something else. Kayla said that it seemed like Conrad was covered in burns, blood, bruises, or something else. She couldn't quite tell what was all over him, but she knew that something was wrong. Kayla asked Conrad what happened, and he said he didn't know, but that his hand hurt. He reached out his hand, and Kayla was horrified when she saw that his fingertips were a dark purple color, and his fingernails were completely curled up. She said that Conrad appeared to be very out of it. He was actually sitting on the couch naked, covered with only a blanket, but she could still see that his legs had a green color to them, and there were these massive sores all over his body, including on top of his head. So Kayla started to feel really sick by what she was seeing and was honestly kind of in shock. Megan called Kayla just a few moments later and asked her if she got the card number, and on speakerphone, Conrad started calling out the numbers to Megan. Kayla didn't even know what to say at that point, because... They were acting like everything was normal, business as usual, casual. And after Megan hung up, Kayla told Conrad, look, look, I'll be right back. So Kayla went outside and decided to call her mom to tell her what was happening. During the call with her mom, Megan called back and Kayla said, Megan, something is wrong with your dad. And Megan just laughed and said, oh, he's just drunk, clearly not really understanding what was going on. So Kayla tried to reiterate that this was something more than just being drunk and Megan told her to call her brother Austin to handle whatever was going on. She didn't want to deal with it. It was her birthday. She was going to party. So Kayla called Austin and told him what she saw, and he told her to hang up and call 911 and that he would be on his way. So Kayla was pacing back and forth in the driveway because she was really nervous and disturbed by how Conrad looked and that her best friend Megan didn't seem to be grasping the severity of the situation. About 15 minutes later, a fire truck and EMTs arrived at the house. They had to make their way through the extremely cluttered home to get to Conrad on the couch, who at this point was still alert and talking, but kind of dazed and confused. Kayla said that when they brought Conrad out on the stretcher, she could hear him speaking Polish, which is what his mother spoke to him during his childhood. As he was being wheeled through the driveway, Austin and his friend Lucas arrived at the house. Austin ran up to his dad and asked him what happened, and Conrad said he didn't know, but that he was fine. And he clearly was not fine, and as the ambulance drove him away, Lucas and Austin decided to go inside to see if they could figure out what happened. In the living room, Austin said that there was blood and some white powder on the couch where his dad had been sitting, and that he could smell a chemical smell. Austin, Lucas, and Kayla rode together to the hospital, and when they arrived, Austin and Lucas went into the room first to talk to Conrad, and they told him that he really didn't look good, that something was wrong. Conrad told them that he had set off a bug bomb in the home because the cats had fleas, but Austin and Lucas both agreed that even though you're supposed to leave the area during a bug bomb, it probably wouldn't have caused that extensive of injuries. But Conrad kept saying he couldn't really remember much, but did end up saying that he thinks Megan had thrown some stuff at him, like bread, clothing, 
hair dye, and maybe cleaning supplies. So Kayla ended up letting Megan know that they were at the hospital with her dad. A short time later, Austin said that Megan called his phone and started asking him about how to get their dad's bank card to work. And Austin told her, I don't know, and I don't care. I'm at the hospital. Like, why is this your priority right now? And he said that Megan then kind of made a scoffing sound and hung up on him in a very angry and annoyed way. At that point, no one had fully explained what was going on with Conrad, just that something was wrong. So in Megan's mind, I guess maybe she could have thought that he just fell or maybe he had alcohol poisoning or something like that. Granted, most people would be a little more concerned about their parents being in the hospital, but maybe she was just thinking this was another one of his antics, another drunken day, he's ruining my birthday, forget him, who knows. So while Conrad was speaking to Austin about what happened, a nurse overheard him say that Megan had possibly thrown something on him, and whatever it was appeared to have caused the injuries to his body. At that point, the nurses were almost certain that they were looking at chemical burns and that Conrad would need to be transferred to a hospital more equipped to deal with the seriousness of his injuries. The nurse who realized that someone may have actually purposefully done this to Conrad decided to call and report the incident to the police. During this time, Austin also made a phone call to his mom and briefly explained what was going on before asking her to go over to Conrad's house to find his cell phone. Julie said that she would go and she had her younger daughter Morgan's boyfriend go with her because she knew the usual state of her ex-husband's home and didn't know if she was going to need help with anything or not. So when Julie and Morgan's boyfriend arrived at the house, they made their way up the stairs and Julie was even more horrified than usual about the condition of the home. There was only about a one-foot path or trail from the stairs to where Conrad sits on the couch. Austin also asked her to look if she could see any chemicals lying around that could have caused a chemical burn. They made their way through the house looking around for Conrad's phone and any obvious chemicals. And Julie said that as soon as they went into the basement, she gagged from the smell of cat urine and feces. She then went into the bathroom, and the entire toilet was completely full of feces, to the point that it couldn't even be flushed. She said they peered in Conrad's bedroom, and there wasn't a bed in there anymore, and that there was actually mold throughout the entire home. They then went back up the stairs and decided to call Conrad's phone, which ended up being underneath a piece of paper on the coffee table next to the couch where he had clearly been sleeping. The couch, which looked to be maybe a suede or some microfiber fabric, was worn in the areas that he frequently sat on. And it sort of had a damp appearance, and while it could have been wet, it also could have been from body oil stains, from someone sitting there for years, just secreting. Gross, gross. However, she did say that the rug in front of the couch was wet, and that there were several plastic bags that had presumably human urine and human feces inside of them. She noticed that white powder on the couch too, but didn't see a container from where it could have come from. They took photos of any chemicals they found around the kitchen and then left to bring Conrad his phone at the hospital. When Julie arrived, she walked in the room and noticed that Conrad still seemed a little drunk or was possibly feeling good from the pain medication that he had been given because he was in a very chipper mood. She asked him what was going on and he said, I don't know, but they're giving me medicine and everyone's coming to see me. Conrad was then taken back to have some tests done and to get him ready for transport. While nurses and hospital personnel were asking Conrad questions, he told them that he had only had one Smirnoff lemonade. He said he drank half of it, fell asleep, and was woken up in the morning by his daughter. He said they argued a little bit, and then he drank the rest of that drink that was just sitting there. Then he said he got up, set off a bug bomb, and watched a movie. However, the nurses could tell that he was drinking more than just one Smirnoff. At around 9 p.m., he got some blood tests, and they found out that his blood alcohol level was a .255, well over the legal driving limit and legal limit of .08. That was nearly six hours after the ambulance arrived, so you can imagine how high it must have been when he was still at his house. During his tests, three state troopers arrived to begin investigating what had happened. They spoke to Austin, his friend Lucas, Kayla, and to Julie, and were informed that the only two people who had been in the house were Conrad and his daughter Megan. 
They told the troopers about that white powder they saw, and how Conrad mentioned Megan possibly throwing something on him. Before the troopers were able to speak to Conrad, he was transported to a different hospital to begin immediate treatment of his severe burns. After he left, Austin got permission from his roommates to bring his father's cats to their house. So when Austin got back to Conrad's, he started to look a little more in depth for any chemicals, and he noticed a bottle surrounded by white powder on the couch. However, Julie somehow hadn't seen this bottle, even though they both examined the same areas of the home. But remember, it was extremely cluttered, hard to make sense of anything that you're seeing. So when Austin sees this, he called and started screaming at Megan and blamed her for causing the burns on their dad. During this same time, the troopers decided to go look for Megan to ask her some questions, and Julie let them know what hotel she and her friends would be staying at for her birthday party. At around 12.15 a.m., three troopers pulled into the hotel parking lot, and they saw a group of teenagers in a vehicle that appeared to be getting ready to drive away. They approached the vehicle and asked if Megan was in the car, and the kids said yes. So Megan got out of the car, and the troopers began asking her questions in front of their cruiser, all so that the conversation would be captured on the dash cam. They told Megan that she wasn't under arrest and that they just wanted to speak to her because her father was in the hospital. They said they were trying to help the nurses figure out how to treat him by determining what was thrown. Megan didn't admit to throwing anything at first, but the troopers kept asking, and eventually she said she threw some bread. They asked if she threw any water, and she said she might have thrown a water bottle, who knows, but wasn't sure if she got anything on him. They really drove home the fact that they needed this information to help her dad. And then they asked her if she thinks any of the random things that she might have thrown may have looked like a white powder, to which Megan replied, I think so. So with this uncertain admission, the police took that as a confession of Megan throwing a chemical powder on her dad and they placed her under arrest. After Megan was taken to the police station, one of the troopers went to the hospital that Conrad had been transported to. He began asking him questions, and Conrad stated that he and Megan got into an argument and that she threw some stuff. He didn't specify what stuff, but the trooper asked for permission to enter his home to gather evidence, and Conrad told him that it was fine. So when the troopers arrived at the house, they noticed the hoarding and the diabolical conditions of the home. I mean, there were bugs on the ceiling. They also noticed a bottle on the couch surrounded by the white powder. And one of the troopers photographed this bottle. And on the bottle, there was a label that said, Gets the clog out. Household 100% lie drain opener. Danger. Poison. Causes severe burns read all instructions carefully before use. And it also had a little picture of a skull and crossbones, you know, like a big warning symbol. Now, for some reason, the troopers decided to leave the substance there on the couch. They wouldn't return, though, until several weeks later to collect the lye bottle to bring it into evidence, even though at that point, several people had been in and out of the home. They also didn't fingerprint the bottle, because since Megan was the one who brought in groceries and lived there, her fingerprints would have more than likely been on it anyway. After Megan was arrested, she was initially charged with one count of assault with intent to do great bodily harm, less than murder, and one count of a domestic charge. She received a $75,000 personal recognizance bond and was released, but Conrad was still trapped in a place far worse than jail or prison. Right when he arrived at the burn center, the gruesome and indescribably painful process of caring for his injuries had to begin. One doctor that helped treat Conrad stated that the first thing they had to do was get him into the operating room as quickly as possible to debreed the burns. So this is when they actually scrape and remove the damaged and dead skin and tissue. So that way the new skin has a better chance at healing. It's also necessary if there are going to be skin grafts later. Now, I don't even want to think about how painful that would be because even if you are sedated for the initial procedure, I'm sure that the wound care and the cleaning is absolutely horrible. There really isn't a reason to specifically name where the burns were located because they were honestly all over. They were literally everywhere from head to toe. The doctor also stated that the burns are generally categorized on a scale from one to four, with four being the worst and the most thick and most of Conrad's burns appeared to be between level 3 and 4. 
Austin was listed as Conrad's next of kin, and he would be the one to make any medical decisions that his father was unable to make or authorize. The day after he had arrived at that burn center, Julie made a family group text with all of her children, but Austin told them that they were not welcome to see Conrad. And I'm not exactly sure why he decided this, but it seems like he might have thought that the family didn't think Megan hurt their dad on purpose, while he wholeheartedly blamed her and believed that she did this out of anger. So skin grafting was attempted, but as soon as any progress was made, infections started taking over. He endured multiple infections, and due to the pain, Conrad spent a lot of time under sedation. He ended up needing a tracheotomy because, for some reason, he completely lost his voice, and it was thought that the inhalation of the chemicals could have caused some lung damage, too. He also needed kidney dialysis, but he wasn't progressing as well as everybody had hoped. It might have been because he had such a compromised immune system anyway, but eventually the infection on his left leg got so bad that Austin had to make the decision to allow for the doctors to amputate it. Not long after that, Conrad ended up losing his right leg as well to a similar infection. After five months of enduring these horrible procedures, shock, pain, and trauma, Conrad felt like he didn't want to continue existing on life support any longer, when none of the treatments were working anyway. So he decided that he was going to go back home and spend as long as he could on hospice so that he could enjoy whatever time he had left away from the hospital. When Austin learned that his dad wanted to come home, he and his friends worked their butts off to clean and fix up the house. I mean, the house was absolutely despicable, so I'm surprised hospital staff would even release him back there, even if it was somewhat clean, because you know that that place needed to be completely fumigated for bugs, treated for mold, and I can't imagine the amounts of bags of trash, food, and human waste that were just all over the house. It's no wonder that Conrad didn't have an immune system, and I hope to God that they bought him a new couch and an actual bed for his final resting time. After he was back home, Austin did not allow for any of his family members besides some of Conrad's side to come and visit. Morgan and Ian weren't able to come see their father, even though their presence may have helped brighten his mood. And unfortunately, only three days after he returned home on hospice, Conrad ended up passing away due to complications from his injuries, and he died on March 6, 2022. Austin reportedly didn't notify his family right away about his passing, and they only found out when Megan was rearrested. The medical examiner that performed Conrad's autopsy following his death concluded that he died of chemical burns with complications that compromised his kidneys and lungs, and he ruled the manner of death as a homicide. So Megan's original charges were upgraded from to unlawful possession or use of harmful devices causing death. Megan remained in jail for nearly 15 months until the beginning of her trial, which after jury selection began on June 12, 2023. The jury heard from Megan's friend Kayla, who was the one to find Conrad the day of the incident. She explained how Megan had asked her to go get the PIN number from her dad and talked about the disturbing injuries that she viewed on Conrad before calling Austin and 911. The jury also heard from Austin's friend Lucas, the friend that went with Austin to the hospital and also to the home to retrieve the cats. Lucas and a nurse testified that they actually heard Conrad say that Megan may have thrown cleaning supplies. There was testimony from the EMT, a doctor, and another nurse that had treated Conrad, and they described the horrible condition of his wounds upon arriving at the hospital. One of the state troopers who led the investigation took the stand as well. He testified about how he ended up arresting Megan after questioning her in the parking lot and about the scene where he photographed and later gathered the lye bottle that was on the couch. Julian Conrad's daughter Morgan testified about her relationship with both Austin and Megan and gave some insight into the clearly tumultuous family dynamic. Julie testified as well and further explained the terrible condition of the home and all of the things that she found that day when she was sent to look for Conrad's cell phone and any chemicals. She was also pressed a little about why Megan and Austin would have been allowed to live with Conrad if his house was in such horrible shape, and she basically just said that she gave them the choice once they were old enough to decide for themselves. Now, the most emotional testimony by far was when Austin took the stand. 
He testified to finding the bottle of lye on the couch and how he felt that Megan wasn't concerned about their father at all and only seemed to care about the credit card and her party. It was clear that he still holds a lot of anger towards his family because he struggled with even referring to Julie as his mother and calling his siblings his brother and sisters. Austin fought back tears when he discussed having to make the medical decisions for his father and how he ended up passing away just three days after being released from the hospital. Now, even though the entire family has stated that Austin had a very volatile and violent relationship with his father, for some reason, he tried his best to minimize his father's drinking problem during his testimony. There was really no argument that Conrad was an alcoholic, but Austin tried to say that his father didn't drink more than most people and that many of the stories about him were exaggerated. Your father drank quite a bit on occasion, correct? Yeah, everyone drinks, sir. Okay. Um, He drank more than most, though, right? No, sir. I will admit this much because I lived there my whole life. He drank, yes, but on more occasions was there more than others, no sir, because at all times, at least especially when I was there and from what I had seen and had always seen, he'd still get up, he was still functional, he still talked, he still called his family, and he still sat there and talked with me in my room, because him and I hung out a lot, sir. Okay. But I will say, no, yes, he did drink, but then again, I mean, who doesn't, who hasn't? Well, he showed up at your graduation party, didn't he? I didn't have a graduation party, sir. Actually... It was a little get-together, but I'm not the one that had planned or hosted it because I did not want one. All right, but he showed up at that party, correct? I mean, he was at the house, so yeah, he was there. All right. He smelled of urine at that time, didn't he? No, sir, not that I know of, no. He smelled totally fine to me that day. He was slurring his speech, wasn't he? No, not that I know of either on that day. Because on that day, in an honest answer, an honest remembering, he smelled fine, and he wasn't stuttering no speech. But also, then again, I was hanging with a bunch of people. So you didn't talk to him? No, I'd spoken to him, yes, but he had nothing like that you are saying on him or described in that way. The medical records indicate that he was severely intoxicated. Would you disagree with it on that day? No, because I know that's something that the nurses did tell me about, that he had shown up with a pretty high level. All right, and... Go ahead. You indicated when you got there in your preliminary exam transcript that he was slurring his speech the first time. I put that in my transcript. Is okay. that what you said? Or That's what you testified to last time. I testified to that he drank, yes, sir. Because I'm not going to lie and say that someone doesn't drink alcohol. If that's what you're asking, yes. And last time, that is what I testified to, is the fact that, yes, he does drink alcohol. He did slur his speech on that He did not slur his speech. No. Not that I know of and not that I remember hearing. And I knew my father pretty damn well. Uh The prosecution's argument was that, that Megan intentionally concocted a mixture of lie to pour on her father, all in order to hurt him or even kill him. They said that they believed Megan was so upset that Conrad was passed out that she threw the mixture onto him while he was sleeping. They showed photos of the couch and pointed to the areas that, in their opinion, appeared to be wet and referred to the video of Megan talking to police about possibly throwing a bottle of water and maybe some powder. When the defense gave their statement, they stated that Conrad wasn't passed out when Kayla arrived and that Conrad told people he was awake during he and Megan's argument. He said that he drank his Smirnoff, got up, released a bug bomb, and watched a movie. It was obvious to everyone that Conrad had more to drink than just one Smirnoff, considering that his blood alcohol level was so high at the time it was tested hours later, so it would have been unlikely for him to just be passed out after just one. But it seems more likely that Conrad said he was awake and got up and continued to do things, including drink more alcohol, up until Kayla arrived at the house. They pointed to the fact that no one else who saw the couch that day reported that it appeared to be wet and only that there was a pool of liquid on the floor next to the couch that stretched from one end to the other. The defense said that considering Conrad's urinary issues and the fact that he had been relieving himself at the couch, it's possible that the liquid could have just been urine. They said that Julian Morgan's boyfriend didn't see the bottle of lye on the couch either, which Austin and the troopers found after people had already been in the home. 
They argued that the investigators didn't bother to gather the lye bottle at first or test it for fingerprints, which could have indicated that someone else touched the bottle as well. They said that the couch wasn't tested for liquid and neither was the pool of liquid on the floor to see if it was in fact water, which would have reacted with the lye. They also stated that Conrad's skin and burns were not tested to even determine whether or not the substance on his body was actually lye or something else. There was no experiment done to determine what would actually happen if lye and water were left on someone for that period of time, which would have been nearly six hours between the time that Megan and Conrad had the altercation and when Kayla arrived at the house. They stated that in the prosecution's theory, Megan threw a bottle of water onto her father, but the amount of liquid on the floor and on the couch far exceeded the amount from one single water bottle, and they didn't attempt to even locate a water bottle or anything that could have been used to throw water or a mixture of the lye. There was also apparently no experiment done to determine whether or not a bug bomb could have caused any of his injuries either. The defense also said that the majority of the worst burns were concentrated on Conrad's hands, which could indicate that he had rubbed in the powder himself, especially since there were no injuries to Megan's hands, and if the lye had been made into a paste, it would have needed to be rubbed in, not just thrown or sprinkled over him. When sprinkled on the skin, lye itself is an irritant, but it doesn't always immediately cause horrific burns like we saw on Conrad. Lye is actually used in a lot of household products as well, like paper, detergents, and even food like pretzels and olives. It's common in cleaning products like oven cleaner, window cleaner, and the drain opener like Drano, and lye is most commonly known as a key ingredient in soap. The type of lye that was found in Conrad and Megan's home was the type that would be used as a drain opener. Unlike Drano, that comes already mixed into a liquid, the variety here was a powder. So to make lye like this activate and to become harmful to the skin, it's not like you'd have to conduct some elaborate chemistry experiment. Lye is activated by simply being mixed with water, and prolonged exposure to the skin can cause severe burns. Many people think that mixing water and lye will immediately dissolve someone's skin, but that's also not 100% true. I did my best to research how lye reacts differently with water temperatures, but I was still left a little uncertain about what temperature would cause the type of reaction that caused Conrad's burns. This creator on YouTube did an experiment to show what happens when you mix lye and lukewarm to cool water and put it on your skin. In his video, it does start to irritate the skin, but after he quickly washed it off with cold water, there was no damage. In this video, when lye was mixed with room temperature water, it took a few minutes for the water to reach a dangerous temperature. And then obviously, with really hot water, the lye has an almost instantaneous reaction. So throwing lye on Conrad alone wouldn't have caused the severe injuries that he was left with. It would have probably eventually started to irritate his skin, but without the reaction with a liquid, it wouldn't have immediately started to eat away and burn his flesh. That's why the troopers and then the prosecution needed to conclude that Megan either threw water as well or even mixed the water and lye and then spread it as a paste on her dad. The other alternative in all of this would be if she did sprinkle the lye on him, and if he did wet himself, could that have activated something? And due to the chemical makeup in urine, could that have made it more severe? Could that have caused more severe chemical burns? I don't know. I'm not a chemist. So the defense argued that when the troopers questioned Megan, she had been partying with her friends and they never asked her if she had been drinking or smoking or had been doing anything that may have affected her answers. She was also clearly very nervous having three officers around her, and the defense argued that they were asking leading questions, like what about the powder and did you throw any water? In closing, the defense stated that due to Conrad being so intoxicated and that he even said he got up to do things after his argument with Megan, that it's possible he somehow got the lie on himself, or maybe even something else caused his burns. He doesn't remember what happened. But since the burns, the powder on the couch, and the liquid weren't tested, it's not known for sure that it was, in fact, the lie. He also insinuated that maybe someone else placed the lie bottle there after the fact, since people had come and gone before the police photographed and later came and collected the bottle, or that it was maybe even thrown by someone else after Megan had left. 
I mean, the defense really tried to come out strong with their arguments. To prove the charge of unlawful possession of chemical irritants causing death, the prosecution needed to show that Megan placed, used, or released a chemical irritant to frighten, harass, injure, batter, or kill Conrad. You don't have to find an actual intent to kill ahead of time. You don't have to find that she did this with the desire to kill him. The defense asked the jury to only accept the evidence on the record and that the prosecutor was creating situations that hadn't been proved, like Megan throwing enough water or any water to react with the lie, or that she mixed water and lie and spread it on him somehow while he was asleep. Even though the evidence in this case was arguably mostly circumstantial, after only a four-day trial and two hours of deliberation, on July 15, 2023, the jury did end up finding Megan guilty. Guilty of chemical irritants, unlawful, call, unlawful use causing death. Thank you. Judge, the jury pulled? Yes, Your Honor. Chair in seat number two, is that, was that your verdict? Yes. Chair in seat number three, is that, was that your verdict? Yes. Chair in seat number four, is that, was that your verdict? Yes. Chair in seat number five, is that, was that your verdict? Yes. For felony cases, Michigan uses an indeterminate sentencing system, leaving the sentence up to the judge's discretion. There are general sentencing guidelines, and the prosecution can give their input on what they think the sentencing should be, but ultimately, the decision is up to the judge. The sentencing hearing was set to be held 10 days following the verdict. So this case was pretty controversial amongst members of the true crime community, with some believing wholeheartedly that Megan killed her father on purpose during a tantrum about a hair appointment. However, others believed that Megan had a horrible home life, had pent-up resentment, and just wanted one day where her father would follow through on his promises. They think that she could have just started grabbing anything in her vicinity and didn't realize that she threw the lie powder and probably didn't even know what lie was. Now, I know before researching it, I wasn't aware of exactly how lie worked, and Megan even stated that she didn't know that by just mixing something like that with water, it could cause such horrible damage. Many younger people aren't aware that things like drain cleaner can possibly burn someone. So if Megan was in an angry state, just grabbing and throwing things... I do think it's possible that she didn't stop to read the bottle and may not have noticed all of the warnings on the label or may not have thought that it would mix and combat and then burn him. Also, since she left only a short time later and her dad seemed fine, it may not have occurred to her that anything bad was happening. Like I said, that's just some people's opinion. There are others who think that Megan possibly threw the lie but didn't throw any water. Maybe after the dry powder started to irritate Conrad's skin, he went to take a shower and the hot water caused the severe burns. Or like I said, maybe he urinated himself on the couch while laying there. And as gross as it is, pee is generally pretty warm. We know that. And we also don't know with the pH balance and all that if that could act as an accelerant. Regardless, I know alcohol was used in the old days as a type of anesthetic, where soldiers would chug some before getting an amputation on the battlefield and things like that. So it does have some numbing properties. But you'd think that if wet lie were sitting on Conrad for hours and hours, that he would have noticed more than his hand just hurting a little bit. But I guess that depends on his level of intoxication, which we know it was very high. There was also a strange discrepancy that some people noticed during the testimony regarding the timeline. Like in the Letitia Stalk trial, Judge Victoria Valentine allowed for the jury to ask any questions they had after each testimony, but this jury barely asked anything. Now, one thing I would have asked about was during Megan's friend Kayla's testimony. She said that she arrived at the house around 4 p.m., spoke to Conrad for a moment, then talked to her mom and Megan before calling Austin. That was around 3.47 in the afternoon she called me. Okay. Uh, and you talked to her on the phone then? Yes. How did she seem? I don't know. Um, just normal, okay. pretty much. What did she ask you to do? She asked me to go over to the house and get the credit card information from her dad because it wasn't working when she was at the hotel. Okay. Now, you said you were about one or two minutes away driving. Yeah. Did you drive or did you walk? I drove. Okay. Did you leave right away? I took a few minutes to eat something and then... Okay, and then you left? Yeah. So, do you have an idea about what time you got to Conrad Amirowitz's house? I don't. Okay. Was it still afternoon? Yes. All right. It was just a few minutes after. Understood. He asked me to look for his phone. And so he pointed to, like, the desk table area, like, next to the couch. And so I tried to look for the phone, but I couldn't find it. 
And then I got a call from Megan. Okay, so Megan called you at this point? Yeah. All right. How long had it been since you talked to her last? Like, the, maybe 10 or 20 minutes. It was like the last time was when I was about to leave my house. Okay, let's, let's stop for a second. You're outside, you're talking to your mom. Yeah. And then Megan calls again. Yes. And you pick up the phone. Yes. What did you tell her? I said, Megan, something's wrong with your dad. And what did she say? She says, oh, he's j just drunk and then laughs. She laughed? Yeah. Okay. Did you tell her anything else? I was like, no, something is wrong. And then what? She told me to call Austin. She said, call Austin? Yeah. And who was Austin? Her brother. Okay. And what happened after she told you to call Austin? I called Austin. However, Austin stated in his testimony that Kayla didn't call him until 6.58 p.m. So I was at home. Then Kayla had called me at 6.58, letting me know my dad was in bad condition. I told her how to help him and to call the police and rushed over when I got there. He was sober, conscious, but had the burns when they took him to the hospital. I then checked the spot where he was. Where he, where he was there, there was blood and smell of some chemical. So I'm not sure if that was an error or if there was a large gap of unaccounted for time. You'd think that if there was actually this large area of unaccounted for time that the defense would have used this to certainly create some reasonable doubt by saying that someone else could have entered the home between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and then maybe even while Kayla said she was there between 4 and 6.58. Others have wondered if Megan actually knew that the lie was going to severely injure or even kill her dad. Others wonder that if Megan actually knew that the lie was going to severely injure or even kill her dad, why would she have sent her friend over to find him? If she knew that her father was going to be burned, why would she want someone to get there and potentially get him help if she wanted him dead? During an interview after the verdict, jury stated that while she had no proof, she believes that Austin would have been more likely to hurt Conrad, especially given the fact that he has physically harmed him in the past. We have video of Austin hitting, kicking, screaming at his father. Not just one video. Um, not at his father? Video. Yes. Yes. There were four people who arrived in the car. Oh, a total of four people in the car that Austin arrived at the house. In. Are you talking only, about on October 1st? Yes. Only three of those people that arrived in the car left in the car. They added Kayla. Um, and But then Blake did not go with them. There was not anything on the couch where Conrad was sitting on the left side um, when I was there. Are you saying that Austin did it? I have more proof that Austin did it. Um, there's more probability that Austin did it because of his very violent nature. Um, he often got into fights. He fought with Conrad, physically fought with Conrad, um, not just verbally. With the felony conviction and Megan being a few days over 18 when the incident occurred, she was facing life in prison for the death of her father. Taking into account the charge, Megan's age, and criminal history, the sentencing guidelines set her sentence between 51 and 85 months, or nearly seven years. On July 25th, 2023, at the sentencing hearing, the prosecution asked for the higher range according to the guidelines and requested that the judge sentence Megan to seven years. Before Judge Valentine made her decision, Megan asked to make a statement to the court since she had decided not to testify during the trial. And honestly, her statement was very emotional and many people thought it was genuine, but there were people who thought that her cries were fake and that she was only begging for mercy from the judge because she was still being selfish and not taking full accountability for her actions. The statement she made was over 15 minutes long, so I won't play all of it here, but I will play some of what I found to be the most impactful clips. 19 years ago, I was placed into the arms of the first man to ever love me. 
the man unlucky enough to call my dad. Growing up, he became so much more. He was a storyteller, a tooth fairy, a friend and hero. But through it all, the one thing that never changed was that he was mine. And then there's me. It's almost been two years and I haven't been able to mourn. I refuse to think he's gone because no part of me can handle losing him. When I was younger, I'd count the days until I could live with him with my dad full time. And when that day finally came, for the first time in my life, I could finally exhale. He was my best friend and the person I talked to about boys, the one who knew every single thing about me and my favorite person to laugh with. My dad has always been the one constant in my life. That alone, and that created an unbreakable bond between us and no one, not especially Mr. DeSantis, can take that away from me. I never got to say goodbye, and that's a scar I'll never be able to lose. I get so scared that he thinks I didn't love him because I wasn't allowed to be there and hold his hand. On October 1st, I woke up only to find my dad drunk. Yeah, it was disappointing, but I understood why he was. Those last weeks, few weeks were hard on us because Austin was moving out, and we weren't ready for that. Those last few weeks, I self-harmed, so who was I to be mad at my dad for his way of coping? Yeah, I whined and complained, but it was no different from any other time. He kept falling asleep in the middle of, my, of me complaining, and when I yelled, Dad, he wouldn't wake up. So I tossed some bread at him because he pees in bags and puts them on the floor, and it leaked that day, so I couldn't get to him to tap his leg. When he didn't wake up, I tossed some lightweight things at the end of the couch so it would vibrate and wake him. I never threw water, but I knew why the couch was wet, so it was easier to lie than to admit your dad made himself. He did wake up, though, and we talked it out. And although Mr. DeSantis would like to theorize on his consciousness, my dad and I both have said that we talked it out, and we don't leave angry. I would never and have never hurt my dad. I am not my brother. And I'd like to point that out, that my party wasn't a big deal. I'd already celebrated, and if the hotel didn't work out, me and my friends would, still, would have still hung out. And you want to know how I spent my birthday? My dad woke me up with cake and my favorite foods. You know why? Because he's a good dad. Yeah, he had his problems, but he was human. And just like humans, he felt pain and coped with it. He was going to get better one day. I believed in him. And now I don't even get to see that day. One major thing I'd like to point out is that my, to my dad told the police and my brother my bro and my brother, I didn't do it. And only that did that change after being alone with Austin, who admitted he told my dad that's not ha what happened. But how would he know? So when Austin didn't like the truth, he changed it. But he can't change my truth. Not this time. I've watched as you've given so many people chances, and some who may not have deserved them. And once, once upon a time, you dreamed of being a judge. And part of me believes it's because some people deserve another chance. You've accomplished your dream, and I guess now I'm asking for you to help me accomplish mine. Basically, Megan was asking for Judge Valentine to take into account that she loved her father, that she would have never intentionally hurt him, and that a lot of what was said wasn't actually what happened. I guess what Megan was alluding to was that she believes Austin was the one to hurt their father. While there isn't any concrete evidence pointing to Austin, I can maybe see why Megan would think that or even force herself to believe that. So Megan asked for the low end of the sentencing range, which would have been about four years, I believe. However, no one was expecting the sentence that Judge Valentine would actually come back with. Ms. Amerowitz, case number 2022-281-519-FC, harmful devices irritants, unlawful possession, or use causing death. And with regard to this matter, the court has reviewed the PSI. It has reviewed your compass score and your prior criminal history. The circumstances that you have endured during your adolescent life um, are somewhat detailed in the PSR. The report indicates physical 
an attempt by a friend of a sibling, which was not addressed by your parents. Your adoptive parents uh, separated when you were eight and a half years old. You had endured both physical and while you indicate that you were raised by both of your parents, the court does recognize that your father was a severe alcoholic. His disease could not make him a fit parent, and he always put you in harm's way. Your childhoods would line with the inability to grow mentally as a child. Your only criminal history was driving offense that your father was unable to drive you. The PSI indicates that he would pick you up while intoxicated and that you had to quit your job to care for your father. Your father described you as an angel, making it clear that you do not have malice. It is clear that your father's addiction and the denial of his addiction alienated his family. Your parents divorced when you were approximately eight and a half years old. Your younger siblings could not endure visiting your father anymore. Your father, your younger sister testified that the last time that she was at the house, she shared a bathroom with your father and that there was vomit in the shower, in the sink, and toilet paper all over the bathroom. The first responders could not attend to your father because of the filth inside the house, that it was not fit for habitation. Your mother, your younger siblings, and your other older brother all left the home, leaving you with the daunting task of caring for your father. The denial of the disease from your father and your brother's belief that your father was not an alcoholic weighed on your shoulders. The mental health that you suffered started to climb when you were 10 years old. You struggled with su suicidal idealizations. You've been diagnosed with severe depression, anxiety. You were hospitalized multiple times, most recently around your 16th birthday for a week in Harbor Oaks Hospital. You did not have the luxury of being a child as you indicated that you had to be an adult in the house. This is a serious crime that you have been found guilty of. The court does not believe that a child your age knew or understood the consequences of throwing the items at your father or the damage that it would cause him. At the time of the incident, you were barely 18 years old. You were three days past your birthday. It is clear that your brain is not developed. This court is satisfied that you are unlikely to engage in offense or criminal course of conduct again, and that the public good does not require that the defendant suffer the penalty imposed by law. The court finds that the sentence must be proportionate to the seriousness of the crime surrounded the offense and the offender. With regard to this matter, the court is going to sentence you to one year in jail with 506 days credit. The guidelines are 51 to 75 to 85, correct? 51 to 85. 51 to 85. Um, with regard to your sentencing, you were sentenced to five years of probation. So Judge Valentine decided to give Megan another chance. And since she was only given one year and had spent more than already that time in jail, she was released immediately. I think Judge Valentine could see that Megan and her siblings dealt with a lot by having a parent who was dependent on alcohol. But Megan especially was the one who basically had to take care of him for several years on her own. Some people have even criticized Megan's mother, Julie, for allowing two of her children to live in the horrible conditions in Conrad's home. Even though they were technically old enough to have a say, it doesn't necessarily mean that they should have been left to live in a hoarding house with bugs, mold, trash, human and cat waste all around, and in the care of someone with clear alcohol dependency. Julie knew that, and it was her responsibility to make sure that her kids were in a safe environment at least up until the age of 18, even if that meant possibly reporting her ex-husband and demanding sole custody. The prosecutor was clearly upset by Judge Valentine's decision and asked for her to at least put Megan on a tether, which was ultimately denied. Mr. Sanis. Your Honor, I do of course have to object. I do not believe that that sentence is proportional. Uh, which is the measure here or reasonable. I have um, looked at everything in this case. I sat through the trial and I am satisfied based upon the information that I cited um, that she is not a threat to society, although I am going to have the intensive probation. Um, but I'm going to allow her to get on track and get back some of the years that she has lost um, as with her history. So the court is satisfied with regard to the proportionality. May I request a, a GPS tether in home confinement for the per duration of probation? For how long? I would say for the duration of probation. For five years? Yes, Judge. Someone died. 
horribly. And I, I also want to note, Your Honor, that there, in <clears throat> excuse me one second. But you are to continue your education. I want you in therapy. I want your mental health treated. I expect you to do good things, Ms. Amirowitz. Okay, carry on your father's name. But Megan will be on probation for five years. She'll have to graduate from school and undergo extensive counseling and therapy. Now, there are some people who think that with this lenient sentence, Megan is basically getting away with murder. But I'm curious, what do you guys think? Do you think there was enough evidence to know for sure whether or not Megan actually threw lye and water on her dad or that she possibly even mixed the water and lie together and spread it on him? Or are you with the people, including Judge Valentine, who think that Megan didn't even know what lie was, or that it would cause such a horrible reaction? Tell me what your reaction was when she, tell me what you were thinking when she pronounced sentence. I was shocked. I definitely didn't think that she was going to give me a chance, but I was praying for a miracle today, and that's what I got. I was really happy. So tell me what you were thinking when you were giving your statement. Honestly, I I was just in the moment. I wanted every single word to be heard and felt by everybody. Um, writing that took months. And at the very last minute, I finally found the words. So to be able to get those words out meant a lot to me. And what about, you also heard the letter from Austin and your Uncle Thomas. What did you think when they were reading that letter? I was really angry because some of the things in there that they said about me weren't true at all. And I just wanted to stand up and make those corrections. But I was really hurt that my brother acts like he cares about my dad, but he, he's the one who hurt him. The defense didn't offer an alternative theory. So what do you want people to know about that day? I want them to know that I never threw any chemicals at my dad. I would never intentionally hurt my dad. And everything that was ever said about it were lies that I can't believe were told. And knowing that my dad tried to tell them that it wasn't me, I mean, I feel like in the end, my dad always knew that I was going to come out of this. And that day just, it didn't happen the way that everyone wants to say it is. At the end of the day, what happened to Conrad is absolutely horrific and is probably one of the worst and most excruciatingly painful ways to die. But even during all of his suffering, I don't think he blamed Megan. Maybe that's because they were enablers of each other's behavior. Who knows? Like I said before, there's really no way to know for sure what actually happened. But a jury did find her guilty and felt like there was enough evidence to convict her. Many people believe that Judge Valentine has a history of giving undeserving people light sentences, but I'm interested to know how you feel about this case. Do you think the sentence was appropriate? Or should Megan have been given seven years or even life in prison? Do you think that children should be given lighter sentences and the opportunity to change their lives? Megan was 18, but she was still in high school and didn't magically gain maturity or the mentality of an adult on her 18th birthday. And even she was visibly shocked by Judge Valentine's decision. So I hope that Megan realizes and appreciates the amazing opportunity that she's been given to move forward. Hopefully Megan can accomplish some of her goals and at least make her father proud during this second chance at life that she has. He was a good dad and the person that I'll always love the most in this world. And I'm never going to forget him. And I hope that nobody else does either. I've missed her so much. And, you know, I just want to help her get, a, get her life on track. And be a successful person in today's society. Let me know what you guys think about this case, about the sentence, about the situation itself. Was this murder? Was this an accident? What do you make of it? Let me know in the comments below. 
All right, thanks for tuning in with me today, guys. Don't forget, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any other true crime cases as I post them. It is completely free to do it. And for more real-time updates on cases and behind-the-scenes action, you can follow me on Instagram at underscore Annie Elise. All right, until the next case, stay safe. Bye.